Hey everybody, today we're going to look at defenses and before we get started with the specific defenses, the one thing that I want to point out to you guys is that when we talk about defenses, we're not talking about a specific defense for a specific crime. Um, we don't have like defenses that apply to murder and defenses that apply to arson or things like that. Um, in some cases, you're going to see that defenses might apply uh, more frequently to certain crimes than others. So if you're talking about self-defense, you're going to generally be talking about crimes against the person. Someone tries to harm you and you harm them back. Um, but when we look at defenses in general, you could pretty much take any of these defenses and apply them to any crime. So there isn't a whole set of defenses to learn for each individual crime that we discuss. And that's why we waited until the end to discuss them. So we finished up our discussion of crimes against the person. We finished up crimes against property. And now we're going to look at um, what are some things that you as the defendant can raise in response to some of these charges. The first couple that we're going to talk about are really obvious, and if we were in school, the way I usually start this lesson is to have you guys list as many defenses on the board that you can think of. And to be perfectly honest, most of you get most of the defenses that we're going to talk about, but you tend to miss the first few. And these are the ones that are really, um, for lack of a better word, the most obvious, and these are the ones that students tend to miss the most. And the first offense, guys, is that no crime has been committed. So if you're a defendant and you're being charged with a crime, um, there are lots of legal defenses you can raise, but sometimes you want to look at sort of the most obvious thing. And in some cases, a defendant can prove that he or she is not guilty of a crime by showing that no crime has actually been committed. Realistically speaking, when we look at some of these defenses, guys, a lot of them will come to light before we even make it to a trial. So you might be thinking, well, how would a bunch of lawyers let it get to this point? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it's called a finding a fact um, where you have a person telling their version of the story and then the police or the prosecutors are telling their version of the story. And we really need a jury to tell us um, who they think is credible. Who do they believe? But a lot of times when you do have someone that's defending on um, the basis that no crime has been committed, you're not going to necessarily see these defenses actually make it all the way to trial because this is something that will be sorted out well before a trial. But in this case, guys, you're going to have no criminal act or there was no criminal intent. Um, probably the most common case that we do see go to trial where the defense that no crime has been committed is used is when you have a defendant that's been charged with rape and the defense is, well, it wasn't rape because the victim consented. Um, these are very, very difficult cases because in a lot of cases, what it comes down to is we have the victim, we have the defendant, who is the jury going to believe? Um, and a lot of times you'll have the defendant saying that it was consensual. So this is the type of case where you might see this defense come into play at a trial stage. And if the defendant can prove that sexual intercourse was indeed consensual, then they're going to be not guilty by reason of no crime has been committed. All right. Um, here's an example of something that would not make it to a trial, most likely. The second example where a defendant mistakenly picks up the wrong purse when leaving church. Um, so you've got someone who picks up property belonging to another, takes it away. The thing is, in that case, it, they lack the requisite intent for a crime. They're not picking up the purse because they intend to deprive the owner of it. They're picking up the purse because they mistakenly believe that it belonged to them. Um, and I'm sure some of you guys have had this happen to you before. I've had students come in and say, oh, I took, you know, so-and-so's Chromebook in. They were both charging in the back of the room and I grabbed the wrong one. And I didn't even realize it wasn't mine until I got home. Um, or you grab someone else's jacket. If I take my kids places like um, Jim, Jim Barry or Jim Connor or whatever, I'm always like, check your shoes, make sure you have the right shoes, right? You don't want to walk out with um, something that belongs to someone else. Is it a crime if you do so? Not if it was a mistake, all right? So these are the two types of cases that we're going to see no crime has been committed. It's either a mistake or it comes down to um, which side of the story you believe. 
Okay, the next offense is along the same lines, um, but in this case, the defendant is agreeing, yes, there was a crime. There was absolutely a crime that was committed. Somebody should go to jail for this crime or be punished for this crime, but it shouldn't be me. Um, so the second defense we see is the defendant wasn't the one that committed the crime. All right, maybe someone identifies the defendant as the guilty party. Um, maybe there's evidence against the defendant. Maybe the defendant had motive, but if they can go in and prove that they were not the one that actually committed the crime that's in question, then they're going to be um, found not guilty, which is called acquitted, by the way. Uh, a lot of times, guys, this is where alibis come into play, and you guys have probably heard of an alibi before. I'm sure most of you know what it is. Um, the legal definition is evidence that the defendant was somewhere else at the time the crime was committed, um, and this can be proven in a lot of different ways. You might have yourself on um, security footage. You might have a witness come in and say, you know, he was with me all night or she was with me that afternoon. Maybe records showing that you were at work. Um, manifest from a flight showing that you boarded a flight at the time a, a crime was committed. There are all kinds of ways to prove an alibi. You can argue with just your word. It becomes more difficult. Um, again, what it comes down to is does the jury or the judge believe what you're saying? Um, contrary to what we see on TV and the movies all the time, and I always love when they have like a TV show and there's a big case and all of a sudden at the last minute, the defendant drops the alibi bomb on everyone. No one sees it coming. Someone testifies, you know, he was with me all evening and gasps from the jury. Guys, it's not how it happens in real life. If you have an alibi, you have to present that evidence ahead of time because you have to give the prosecution a chance to try to dig up evidence that your alibi um, is not valid. You're arguing you're at work, but they interview people you work with that say you actually left for an hour. Um, or you're arguing that you were at a movie because you have a ticket, but they can look up the ticket for your seat number and show that it was never actually scanned. Maybe you bought the ticket for the movie but you didn't actually go to the movie and use it. So you do need to give the other the other side a chance to look into your alibi, um, just like the other side needs to give you a chance to know what you're being charged with so that you can properly prepare your defense. All right, and then um, one of the things that we're gonna be focusing on here over the course of the next few slides is when we have um, a defendant that commits an act that would typically be considered a crime, but they have either an excuse or a justification. Um, so the defendant says, no, I definitely did what you accused me of doing. Um, however, in this particular case, it was not a crime because of certain circumstances that provide you with a defense. And I know that sounds sort of vague, um, but I think it'll make sense once we give you the example. And probably the best example of this would be self-defense. Okay, so the person who's on trial, you have a defendant that killed the victim and they say, yes, I killed this person. I raised a gun, pointed it, I shot at them. I'm not disputing any of that. However, I killed the victim because they were running towards me also pointing a gun at me. Um, so it was in self-defense. So you're not saying that it wasn't a crime necessarily. You're not saying, no, I didn't actually kill someone. And you're not saying... It wasn't me. You're saying, yes, it was me. Yes, I killed the person, but I have an excuse or a justification for my action. All right. So we do see this a lot of times in self-defense. Self-defense is probably um, one of the most important defenses that we have here. And these are the elements, guys. Um, for self-defense, and I want to note here too, defense of others has the same elements except instead of saying that you're defending yourself, you're saying you're defending someone else. So if it's self-defense, you have to reasonably believe there is imminent danger of bodily harm. So number one, guys, it has to be reasonable. It can't be something super far-fetched. And it has to be imminent danger of bodily harm. So if person A says to person B, I'm going to go home, get a gun, come back and shoot you in three days, and person B raises a gun at person A and shoots them immediately, a court will not find that that's self-defense because in that situation, person B didn't have an imminent fear of bodily harm. They didn't believe it was about to happen right at that second. 
They believe it's going to happen in a couple days from now. So the courts don't just want to give you an out for killing someone that you think um, maybe threaten you in the future. They want you to, to follow proper channels like go to the police, things like that. Um, and you are allowed to use reasonable force to protect yourself or to protect another person. Guys, it can't be more force than reasonably necessary. Um, and what's reasonable can depend on the person. If you have um, a small person, maybe you have a woman that is five foot tall and weighs 110 pounds and you have a man that's six foot five and very strong and maybe weighs, you know, 275 pounds, very muscular. Um, and the woman runs at the man and starts banging her, her fists on his chest or whatever, beating him up, can't even reach his face to punch him. Um, he could probably very easily just take his arm and push her off to the side. He's not really in imminent fear of bodily harm in that case. So if he used deadly force against her, the court might find that's too much. Let's reverse the situations now. You have this giant person who's very strong going after a very small person. Um, if he attacks the woman, the court's probably going to find that she can use a little bit more force against him because it is very reasonable that he could potentially kill her with just his bare hands. Um, and I know there's a lot of loopholes in that example. You could say, well, what if the woman was really strong and just because she's small doesn't mean she's not strong? Yeah, I get it. Um, those are just sort of an example. Um, so here we have the example here. I just sort of typed it out for you guys. Um, and again, you are only allowed to use as much force as is reasonably necessary to protect yourself. And the courts will give you leeway. They don't want you to be in a situation um, where you could potentially be injured. So they will give you a little bit of leeway here. Guys, this is important to note and students ask me about this all the time. So make sure you pay attention here. If after stopping the attacker, the defender continues to use force, the roles can reverse. So if A attacks B and B fights back and A says, okay, man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it and A backs off, and B continues to fight against A, now B is the aggressor. Um, B can be found guilty of whatever, assault, battery, murder, whatever the outcome is, and A is now allowed to defend. Um, so A can use self-defense, all right? So Natalie attacks Sarah, Sarah fights her off, Natalie runs away, Sarah follows her. So once you have gotten your attacker away from you and you're no longer in imminent danger of bodily harm, you cannot continue to fight against them. All right. Um, in this case, Sarah can't claim self-defense because she used more force than was necessary and she could actually end up being charged with assault. So keep that in mind, guys, just because someone initially attacks you doesn't just give you, um, a, a you know, free pass to continue to attack them even after their initial assault stops. All right, guys, I'm going to stop there. We're going to go on to the Castle Doctrine, Stand Your Ground Doctrine, and a couple other defenses in the next slide. Um, as always, if you have questions, either send me an email or put the questions in the comment section. Thanks a lot. Have a good one.